All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get this started. Um, I'm still trying to pull together details, so I'm going to ask you all to bear with me. I still have a little bit of information coming into me um, that I'm trying to get organized for our final presentations here. But I am really, really excited because some of the stuff that I've seen over the past, uh, call it 36 hours now, has been really, really inspiring. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We have a bunch of your pitches lined up. Um, and if anybody's pitches are not included, we will make sure that you're able to pull those together uh, right at the end. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. You should be able to see what I see now. Um, this, for those, those of you who don't know, this is track A final presentations for the MIT COVID-19 challenge. You should hopefully all know why you're here. Um, my name is Paul Cheek, I'm the track lead. I am the hacker in residence at the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. I teach the advanced entrepreneurship class at MIT, and I am very thankful to be joined by some of our partners here today uh, to join us for judging. So over the course of the weekend, you know, we've done a bunch of different stuff. We started out forming uh, uh, problem pitches on Friday night to form teams. You mixed and you mingled and you uh, got together with folks with diverse skill sets from around the world. Um, and then you went to work, you started hacking, you got some feedback, you iterated in all of our practice sessions, and now we're gonna culminate here in the presentations. These presentations will be judged on four different things. The first is impact. Is this gonna have an impact on the real world? Does it solve a real problem for real people? Innovation, is this something new, exciting? Is it adding uh, significant uh, technical advances? Implementation, how much have you thought about how you're gonna take this solution and put it into action? And then the last is presentation. How are you really uh, showing that you, you know what you're talking about and, and presenting the solution that you've come up with? To help us with that, we have three awesome judges. I'm gonna let them each briefly unmute their microphones and introduce themselves. Michael, we'll start with you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for all the, the work this weekend. My name is Mike Frenny, and I work at Partners Healthcare in the Innovation Group, uh, where I focus on business development and our forthcoming Artificial Intelligence Digital Innovation Venture Fund. Awesome, thanks, Michael. And next, we'll go over to you, Esther. Good afternoon, everyone. I also work with um, Mike Frenny at Partners Healthcare. I'm the Executive Director for Digital Health Innovation. Thanks, and then we'll go over to you, Matt. So I'm Matt Hansen. I'm an emergency physician and a physician scientist, uh, as well as a, a technology entrepreneur at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really glad that the three of you could join us to see what all of the participants from around the world have put together this weekend. So the way this is going to work is we have a bunch of the presentations queued up in this master slide deck that I'm presenting from my computer. What I'm going to ask you to do is if you know that your team is up next, we will tell you, it will say at the bottom of the slide, uh, which team is coming up next. The person who is going to be presenting next, I need you to go ahead and open up participants. You can click participants in the toolbar at the bottom and raise your hand. Dibs, one of the track team members will go ahead and promote you to a panelist as soon as it's about to be your turn. A quick reminder that you have three minutes to present and we will do two minutes of Q&A from the judges. Um, please use your time wisely. There will be hard stops. Um, and if you do have any issues, please uh, throw them right into the chat um, and Dibs will, will help, um, help to address those. Please, if your question has already been asked, do not ask it again. We are going to start with team number one, redirect the check. Um, you will see uh, before your team is about to come up when you are coming up next. So please pay attention to that. You'll see on these slides the team that's about to present and the team that is coming up next. Be prepared, raise your hand if you are the presenter for your team. Um, so redirect the check. Um, hopefully we have one of you that is ready to go. You can request to control the screen um, using the screen share functionality of Zoom. You can choose to uh, uh, request remote control from me and I have it set to auto accept your request so you shouldn't have any issues. If you do, please just keep moving and just say next slide and I will go to the next slide or animation for you. Um, so let's get this started. Hopefully we have somebody, do we have, we have Priya. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and promote you to a panelist, Dibs, if you can just take that over for me in subsequent teams, that would be excellent. Um, so Priya, we should have you coming up here shortly. Yeah, Paul, you just have to give me access and I can do that. 
Okay, you um, actually have to request it. So those of you who will be coming up, um, you do need to request access to remote control the screen. Priya, you can take it away. Priya, are you there? We need you to um, unmute the microphone, please. All right, I think you can hear me now. Yep, I'm gonna start the timer right now. Okay, perfect, thank you. Over the last two weeks, over 10 million Americans have lost their jobs or been furloughed. Thankfully, the federal government has stepped up to authorize direct cash payments to millions of Americans. And while this is a step in the right direction, a lot of families will still not be receiving enough money or some others will be forgotten entirely. One of the people who will be receiving money is Jasmine. Jasmine is single. She has a stable job and ample savings. She doesn't really need the $1,200 that she's going to be receiving from the government. On the other hand, you have Olivia, a struggling mother of two who was recently laid off. Her stimulus check may take months to arrive. And in the meantime, she's gonna need a lot of help and support to stay afloat. Finally, we have David, who's an undocumented immigrant. He also recently lost his job, but unfortunately he's not eligible to receive any aid from the government. He's gonna have to make really tough choices between staying safe and putting food on the table. Now, all three of these people live in a very close community in New York City, but as you can see, the crisis has impacted them in very, very different ways. Again, Jasmine, who doesn't really need this money, is going to get her deposit first, whereas Livia, who's in desperate need, will need to wait months to receive some cash, and David will be forgotten entirely by the system. Since Jasmine wants to step up and help, she can simply donate her money to Livia and David. Instead of viewing each other as donors or recipients, Jasmine can simply step up to be Livia and David's hero in their time of need, and they her sidekicks. This really builds on a notion of solidarity, not charity. This really begs the question, how can we redirect funds from folks who don't really need it and who want to help others to those in their community who could really use the help? Introducing Redirect the Check, a mutual aid marketplace where individual donors or heroes can find people in their community that could really use their help at this critical time. Powered by existing technology like AWS, Bootstrap, and Stripe, we can get this off the ground quickly in order to really meet the moment. This platform facilitates direct human-to-human -human transfers. All participants have their identity, identity verified through a simple process and can quickly find potential matches within their own community. 30 seconds. By staying in the community, you keep the donation in the neighborhood and help other businesses as well. Accountability and trust really set us apart from other nonprofits. And what we're looking to do is launch this in time for people to start receiving stimulus funds in mid-April. So I've got to ask, what are you going to do with your stimulus check? Awesome, thank you. And now we have two minutes of Q&A from the judges. Yeah, uh, this is Matt Hansen. How how do you uh, prevent people from fraudulently um, receiving funds or from uh, mis sort of like um, getting you know too much money or something like that? Great question. I can answer. So. Essentially, we have an honor-based system, but we do verify identity to make sure that both donors and potential recipients are who they say they are. And, you know, again, the wall of heroes is really there to build that transparency and to say this person has already chosen to donate money to this particular person. And both of those people are made public so that they can participate in any ongoing transactions once that is already complete. I think looking at your slide here, um, the recipient requires some form of ID and that's going to be a problematic for the undocumented worker that you, um, you're you hoping to donate money to. How do you plan to um, troubleshoot that or reconcile that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So we also are able to use social media like Facebook. So I think that meets half the issue here. And the rest, we have some flexibility in people being able to provide passports or any form of documentation just to let us know that they are who they say they are. So we're building in flexibility because we do understand that the same folks who are being left behind by this bill and this aid are those who are gonna struggle to get on our platform if we don't use alternative forms of ID. Great, I'm gonna cut you off there um, with questions just because we have to move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, great. And now we have Track Trace in Action. Up next is Community Care. Um, team name Community Care, not uh, app name Community Care. I, we noticed that there were two of them in there. Please note this is team name Community Care. Um, so we're going to go ahead and set the timer for three minutes. Um, team Track Trace in Action, please, uh, yeah, get ready to go. Uh, you can start whenever you're ready. If you're track trace in action and you're presenting, can you please raise your hand so I can promote you to panelist? Okay, I think we're gonna move on to the next team community care then if we don't have any hands raised for track trace in action. Community care, team community care, if you could please raise your hand. All right, it looks like we have team community care up here ready to go. Um, if you can just unmute your microphone, you're uh, able to request control of my screen if you'd like to move the slides yourself. Hi, uh, can you hear me? This is RB. Yes, we can hear you fine. Perfect. Uh, how, uh, how do I get controls? I'm sorry, I can't see that option here. I just gave them to you. You have control of my screen. Perfect, thank you. I'm starting three minutes now. Perfect. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to make changes on my end. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we are Team Community Care. Uh, we are a very passionate group of uh, technologists, healthcare experts, um, uh, business and policy experts, as well as uh, data scientists and analysts who are really passionate about being engaged in our community and helping out, especially as volunteers, as well as uh, family caregivers in, in really helping uh, communities uh, take care of each other uh, during this very difficult time that, that we are dealing with. I'm having a little bit of difficulty progressing with the slides. Okay, it looks like you're, you're doing it now. Perfect, thank you. There you go, perfect. Um, so the, the, the current situation, as many of you are familiar with, uh, it's, it's really fraught with anxiety, particularly for the vulnerable population that we are focusing on, which is really the elder communities. Uh, many of them are homebound and isolated and have difficulty with everything from basic needs all the way through very critical medical and, and other healthcare related uh, necessities. And also the community on the other hand is, is very eager to help out, oftentimes uh, really challenged with how to best provide the support and the care that the elder communities need. And And, and, and these type of uh, needs can vary uh, any, anywhere between very basic day-to-day -day care needs around groceries, meals, social engagements and interactions, all the way through very critical healthcare needs that can be medical emergencies uh, requiring daily interventions and virtual therapies, et cetera, which requires a new way of adapting to these type of care, particularly as everything goes virtual, uh, that this is a, an, a real challenge for many of the elder communities because many of them are not as savvy with the use of technology and in many cases find it both intimidating and in fact very distancing. Um, and this is where we think we can step in and help where we have a, uh, I'm sorry, I think this, this I have to apologize, I, I believe this version that's up on the screen is a much older version. Uh, 
So you might see some stickies and notes on this slide. Uh, so please bear with us. There is an actual finalized version that we have. Um, so the, the, the critical thing that we're really trying to address here is many of the elders uh, who predominantly rely on phone, landlines and phone calls to reach out for help, they currently, do, they currently do not have a good mechanism to reach out for help in real time. So what we are putting together is a platform that in real time provides rapid connection for an, for an isolated elder who needs the type of support, but through technologies that they are familiar with on the front end, but on the back end, connecting with the right community members so they can then provide real time, quick, rapid turnaround support within the community. So that's okay, very that's highly localized. Fine. So we'll leave it for two minutes for the judges to ask questions. Thank you very much. And thanks for working through any technical difficulties. Yeah. Uh, so my first question is, is this pool of volunteers, you know, the safety of the, you know, this vulnerable population, how do you ensure it? And, and, you know, kind of like Uber and Lyft do, is there a way to screen, do you envision a way of screening these volunteers? Yes. So for volunteers, there'll be tiers of screening. The first level of screening, which is for basic type of volunteering, is a identification check as well as a criminal background check and also endorsement from local uh, area agencies of aging where they do have very specific background checks that they provide and volunteer training they provide as well. So many in the community already have a lot of these type of backgrounds. And then the other is when we get to the more medical and clinical type of needs, then we are looking for more formal uh, certifications, whether it be like qualifications in nursing and other type of home care. And, and, and we'll make sure that through this platform, we are providing that intermediary validation before connecting volunteers with the elders. Excellent. Any other questions from the judges before we move on? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely appreciate that. We're going to move on to the next team here. Um, and let me just pull up. Um, Dibral, do you have the next team here? Um, let me check my master. Uh, I believe it's disjoin. Disjoin, if you're here, please raise your hand in the Zoom so that we can have you present. All right, it looks like we have team disjoin joining us right now. Um, team disjoin, we have you. Anjali, are you there? Anjali, you're up. And just for everybody else, all other teams, please make sure you have your hands raised in advance. Um, as soon as the questions begin, please raise your hand if you are the next team. It looks like we just lost team disjoin. So as somebody else from team disjoin, please raise your hand. Last call for team disjoin. All right, uh, team co-valid, um, please raise your hand right now so that we can get you up here to present. Who here is from team co-valid? Please raise your hand in Zoom by clicking participants and raise hand. And next up, it's going to be chain facts, so please get prepared. All right, it looks like we have a, do we have anybody from either team? Chain facts, do we have anyone from chain fact? Chain fact, all right, let's go. Uh, D. Lee, we're going to promote you right now.
Hi, anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Um, I will turn the control over to you. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like you have permission, so I'm starting the three-minute timer now. Okay, uh, just one second. Uh, I still cannot control your screen. Let me try again. Okay, one second. Oh, yep, it's working. Uh, just one second. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start now. Uh, we are proposing Chainfact, a decentralized news verification platform to protect the society from the COVID-19 fake news pandemic. And um, the COVID-19 fake, fake news pandemic is as deadly as the virus itself. Two weeks ago, an Arizona man died after taking a form of chloroquine, which he thought is a treatment. And unfortunately, fake news are 70% more likely to be shared on social media than the real ones. And what makes it worse? The media credibility is at all time low right now. Our president is calling CNN and other social media scams and fake news. And this is why we are propose, proposing Chainfact, which has a democratic voting system for organization to vote on the accuracy of the news. If you look at the screen here, this article by BCA is labeled fake news because 80% of the organizations that sign up for our app, including the White House, WHO, BBC, CNN, and so on, they voted that this article is a fake news. And as a result, the credibility score of this BCA media will drop significant, significantly because they are publishing fake news. In order to incentivize users to engage and read our news, we, we will be rewarding users with digital dollar. And our app, um, sorry, and our app is blockchain based to get, guarantee the transparency, the immutability, and the security of the voting result. Here we have a dedicated um, forum section so that users can upvote the news or, me, uh, or article that they would like to be verified by relevant organization. And when you click into the word distribution information, you can find some stats on the voting result. So each word from each organization is recorded as a transaction ID on the blockchain. So it is immutable and is transparent. As I've just mentioned, organizations, they can vote on the news accuracy using our platform. And in turn, this will boost the credibility of their organization. And in the long run, the organizations can actually profit from using our app because they have improved reputation. And from the user end, while they are engaging with, our, uh, with the news, they are being rewarded by digital dollars. And we will bring in advertiser to contribute digital dollar to the ecosystem, the ecosystem so that we can distribute the, the digital dollar to the users. And in summary, we are proposing a decentralized, transparent news verification platform where organizations can vote on the accuracy of the news. And in long term, this will restore public trust uh, to the media. And at the same time, the users are incentivized to engage and read the news on our app. And hopefully, this will protect the society from the COVID-19 fake news pandemic, which can be as deadly as the virus itself. So that's all I have. You were two seconds short, so that is impeccable timing. We'll now throw it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I guess my question is around the democratic process. And, and any idea how many users you might need to make that actually accurate? So when, when they're voting and deciding whether something's fake or not, is there a uh, is there a uh, kind of a ground truth of number of pay, a number of people that you would need to be on that on your server? Yeah, uh, that's very uh, that's a very good question. Uh, in order to be uh, in order to be statist statistically um, um, significant, um, I guess we have to get uh, like more than ten uh, media's and organizations to be involved in the voting process. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, it will it would not be statist statistically relevant. Uh, so I guess more than ten as a start will be a good starting point. And in terms of user, I guess. Uh, we will slowly accumulate users as we are incentivizing them to read and engage with this uh, verified news instead of social media, which is scattered with, uh, with other fake news. So I guess from the user, uh, user endpoint, uh, 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 we can accumulate some active users uh, on a, on a uh, uh, pretty uh, fast pace uh, by using our reward model. 
But the, the tough question is how to get organization like uh, the media, uh, WHO to join uh, this, uh, our, our app. So uh, that's the, uh, I guess that's the, uh, uh, one challenge of it. Cool, and we have time for one more 20 second question. Ma, this is Matt. What if all the organizations that sign up are the producers of the fake news themselves, or if they have very specific political um, points of view? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like just now, uh, in the example that I gave, uh, uh, although, uh, although one, of, one of them voted that their news is accurate, but there will be other 10 media that will vote that this is a fake news. So uh, you can see from the percentage, like 80% vote this is a fake news. So uh, in the end, uh, the users, they can see themselves, uh, the stats, uh, the percentage uh, of, uh, of how many organizations would this is a fake news. So uh, this gives reader the power to decide whether it's a fake or whether it's a true news. Awesome. Thank you very much. We're going to um, quickly go back to team disjoin. Um, it sounds like there was an internet connection problem. So after disjoin, we will have team anchor down. So anchor down, you are on deck. We're going to quickly go back to team disjoin. He's saying that he was removed from the Zoom room altogether. So let's move forward past disjoin for now. Okay, who do we have as panelists right now? Panelists? You've got, you've got Henry here, um, team anchor down. Anchor down, okay. All right, we're gonna go forward with that then and we'll see what's going on with internet there um, for team disjoin um, and hopefully come back to them. Awesome. So we have Henry. Henry, I am going to give you control of the screen so that you are able to click through slides. We're going to start with three minutes right now. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Um, the slide clicking. On. There it is. So it looks like. Uh, so we're going to start with the mission statement, which is to improve the well-being and buy-in to policy guidelines for at-risk individuals across the nation. And we want to do this in, in two ways. First, by developing a learning framework to deliver concise, personalized recommendations to people in a way they're receptive to. And second, collect that information to help insurance companies, local governments, healthcare systems better direct their resources to specific vulnerable populations at a more granular level. So there are two main problems that we, uh, we hope to solve. One is the individual level. Uh, where we're seeing a lot of disconnect between personal concerns and current guidelines, uh, you know, flooding of information and overemphasis on, on, on current convenience, which means that people aren't really listening to, to guidelines or, or, you know, paying attention to some of CDC recommendations. Um, and then there's a, a bit of a disjoint between how people feel, uh, personal responsibility and, and people's obligation to this broader need to stay home and avoid spread. On a system level, there's a lot of difficulty in figuring out where to direct our resources, who is most vulnerable, what is most impactful. Um, there's a lack of targeted information, and it's difficult to identify some specific at-risk populations, especially considering so many carriers are asymptomatic. Um, so with this in mind, we wanted to develop a, uh, a solution here that is in four parts. Sorry, it looks like the slide isn't switching. There it is. Um, and so this solution uh, integrates with social media platforms to ask personalized questions uh, to individuals in an in a easy to access, easy to read, easy to digest way. Uh, we collect this data regarding behavioral patterns, health concerns, population sentiments, how people are feeling, because that is a really important thing in, in our messaging. Um, and then feed this, uh, feed this information through an optimized uh, algorithm. We, we've actually implemented a Markov chain to, to help do this. Um, to help feed users uh, specific targeted behavioral and educational guidelines and resources uh, to help them better navigate their day-to-day -day lives, you know, going to Kroger or what that looks like. Additionally, we take this information and share those to help governments, insurance companies, and others uh, better direct their, their ad campaigns and their marketing, their, their direction of resources, their you know, need to prop up a food bank here or a shelter there. Um, in terms of specific implementation, there's, uh, these four parts translate to four specific implementation components. Try this again. Um, right. Sorry about the tech here. Um, so first, we're leveraging social media platforms. Uh, the fastest way to scale to as many people as possible to get the kind of to get the information that we need um, is to use platforms that are already there. 
So we'd use a dynamic questionnaire, which you know, we've developed and curated that we find across track with medical professionals across the field uh, to generate these system level insights on, on consumer sentiments and behavior. This really helps us hone in on uh, where, where the issues are. Um, and this will, this will help tailor individual recommendations to, to you know, reduce our R0 coefficient. And so in, in this example, you know, I wanted to give one example, you know, Joe is a 67 year old user with hypertension, diabetes. He's retired in Crossville, Tennessee, but he wants to know, you know, how he can get food safely and, and how he can go to the grocery store in a way that's helpful. So he asked a specific set of questions and we can hone in very quickly with the, with the implementation that we have on, on uh, his concerns and guiding him to specific resources about travel guidelines, safety restrictions, uh, food concerns and food bank, and then send that data over to uh, you know, local governments to say, oh, this is a set of the population that is concerned about food in this area. How about we work on, on helping them with, with, uh, with resources there, whether it's setting up a food bank or something like that. And so what okay. we really hope to do here, yep, awesome. We're gonna have to stop there um, and send it over to the judges for two minutes of questions. Perfect. Hi, this is, this is Mike. Uh, thanks for, for the presentation. Uh, question here is, is on the back end of this. So if, if, if you do, you know, find some sort of trend that you want to connect to the, to the you know, whatever, whatever governmental body that is, how do you envision doing that? I, I, have, I would think that would be pretty difficult given how stretched thin people are right now. Um, but what's the plan for that? Right. And so the plan here is actually, sorry, it looks like I can't click very well. Um, so ignore that. Um, so the plan here is actually to de develop open source data sets. So like, here's the trend that we're seeing. Here's how people are feeling about food security and concerns in this specific neighborhood or region and, and generating and maintaining this data set that we can then just share uh, with these agencies because we do believe it's you know, up to them how they, what they wanna do with the information. We're not gonna try to control that. Uh, but that access to that, that this information is something that I think is one step further in, in helping direct resources in an effective way. Henry, if you can go to the appendix slide, I'll just add on that part of the interesting part about this is because our surveys are essentially determined uh, probabilistically, they essentially hone in on tr trends. So our initial prototype effectively went to, uh, figured out what are the most relevant questions to a population um, and identified trends and actually hones in on them by adjusting the weights um, in the Markov chain that implements the survey. Okay, unless there's any other questions, we're going to move on to the next team. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Thanks guys so much. This is great. All right. So now we have COVID-19 versus hunger. Um, and coming up next will be team inflow. Um, please make sure that you are raising your hands in advance so that we can get you promoted uh, to being a participant. Um, and it looks like we don't have anyone raising their hand. Can you please raise your hand if you are team COVID-19 versus hunger? Um, Eric, you do have. Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. Sweet. Um, how do I, how do I check that the I can't see the slides right now. Oh, okay. Yep. Sweet. Just one second. I'm gonna give you control okay. to the screen, Eric. Awesome. Eric Lee. Cool. Yep. Um, and just a reminder, team inflow, you guys are up next. Okay. All right. You should be good to go, Eric. Alrighty. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Lee, and my team's project for this global challenge is community care. Despite efforts around the world in giving to those in need, many demographics still lack essential resources. And we identified two problematic areas that are occurring in many countries. Uh, the first problem is that it is difficult for donors to effectively figure out who they can donate to and who to give those items to. And the second problem is that small businesses are no doubt suffering this time of crises, which much of their normal business gone. Thus, they also need to find new contracts. Uh, these problems are exacerbated because many initiatives cannot access or even locate those in need. Often supply chain is broken or individuals who are suffering did not get selected for aid or they are an undocumented immigrant or there's no aid at all. Uh, current solutions that attempt to address this issue are Facebook groups, local advertisements, and word of mouth. And these are often inefficient and unreliable. 
Furthermore, local charities may not get much publicity or even have the technical capabilities to update their website. Uh, for example, I go to a local college in Southern Missouri and there's a local charity called The Mission and their website isn't even updated to address coronavirus at all, despite the entire town being on lockdown. So we believe that um, community care is a solution to these problems. It's streamlined, it's efficient, sortable, and all information is verifiable through public organization information. Each horizontal column you see in the picture is called a thread. Each thread is made from an individual item that an organization needs. Um, so you can see canned goods in the, for, uh, in the first column, in the first thread. And in this inventory, it's zero out of 45. The purpose is to feed people. You have the organization logo, logo and the address where you can deposit, where you can donate to. And you see its urgency uh, level. Uh, po uh, potential donors can organize these threads according to the aforementioned characteristics uh, to gauge what they can afford to donate. And our solution ultimately shows what charities, shelters, businesses, hospitals, et cetera, need and how many they need in a clear structure. Um, in the future, we also hope to add another page that consists of threads targeted towards outsourcing work to local businesses. So for example, if a hospital needs to outsource a disinfectant, um, a complete cleaning for disinfecting their floors, uh, you can support local businesses through that. 30 seconds. Um, here's an additional feature we implemented that allows individuals in need to request. Uh, this information theoretically gets sent to the nearest local relevant aid organization so it can get a better idea of what to request from donors. Community care ultimately if fixes inefficiencies in the system, lack of structure for smaller aid organizations, and lack of recognition for the individual. We intend to be a middleman between organizations, individuals, and businesses. And in the future, we want to create a fully operational web app, web app that is scalable to thousands of users. And in order to do this, we identified several things that can improve, including additional research, improving our databases, and adding a location API to more accurately see where the requests come from. Awesome, thanks, Thank we gotta stop there. Um, we'll move it over to two minutes of Q&A. Hi, this is Mike. How quickly could you stand something like this up? Um, so our initial prototype, I mean, obviously it only took 36 hours, but um, the backend is not completely complete. Um, if we had several more, so I was the only, um, I'm majoring in computer science and I was the only CS major in my group. If I had a team of maybe four or five, we'd probably get like an initial prototype that works seamlessly in maybe two or three weeks uh, max, I would say. Thanks. How do, you, how do you envision, prior? is there a way to prioritize certain needs or for certain, is it just a simple list that shows up or do certain groups get priority? Because you could imagine if there's, you know, 5,000 needs that show up, um, it could be very difficult for people to navigate. Right. Right. Um, so, so one feature that we have is a search feature where you can list according to level of urgency, or you can organize through which organization you want to donate or a particular item you want to donate for. Um, so those are some things that you can do, but um, by default, it's organized by level of urgency. So anyone who comes onto the website for the first time uh, sees a list listed by level of urgency. Is there a way you'll be verifying um, the local organizations or donors or uh, recipients? Um, so, so, for, so we intend to be a middleman. So we don't verify recipients or donors. Um, the local aid organizations will do that because um, people will go to the local orgs to donate and then people will go to the local or uh, aid organizations to receive things. Um, so we'll be the middleman. But as for verifying those organizations themselves, there is going to be a sign up page. We'll have like a um, profile page where they can sign up and apply uh, to join the website. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. We're going to move on to the next team, Team Inflow. Um, please raise your hand if you have not already. We are going to move the uh, control over to you. Um, so you should have control now. I'm going to start the three minutes uh, now. Okay. Well, Meet Lauren. She is a 44-year-old woman in New York. She just tested positive for COVID-19 because she was exposed at a hospital while getting treated for kidney disease. Lauren is one of 88% of COVID patients who would have to self-treat in isolation since hospitals are at capacity. But she's overwhelmed with too much information and doesn't know how to optimize her recovery at home. 
The problem is that there's no easy way to access centralized, accurate, and relevant information for individuals who need to self-treat and monitor their COVID symptoms remotely. In fact, we don't really know much about the recovery process at all. So the problem here is that there's no easy way to access the information, which is where inflow comes in. Uh, we want to give patients easy access to reliable information for at-home symptom management and use the recovery reports to inform the medical guidelines being put out there. We'd be collecting voluntary information such as age, gender, location from IP addresses, and allow for quantitative and qualitative symptom tracking. Inflow is targeting patients um, who've recovered from or are recovering from COVID-19 symptoms at home who need answers to their questions. Our features include a centralized location for medical guidelines, a simple way to track and share recovery progress, access to helpful resources, as well as global integration through multiple languages and interfaces such as our app, website, and automated phone tree. Going back to how Lauren would use Inflow, we'd provide her with the information she needs to manage COVID-19 and her kidney disease at the same time. Our workflow is simple. Gather information from publications, clinicians, and recovered COVID patients. Leverage community partners such as ACOs and essential services to market inflow to patients by word of mouth, telehealth consults, and the use of QR code stickers on posters and packages. Then, as patient use our compiled information and their recovery data is collected and analyzed, this will go back through inflow to inform and improve the original guidelines. The current system is at capacity and has issues with information reliability. However, Inflow overcomes these limitations by allowing patients to self-track their disease progress daily and share this data however they like. We also have a user-friendly dashboard tool and map to summarize personal and global patient-reported information. Consulting with a medical mentor, she said that there isn't really a way to leverage the data from patient recoveries, so this would be a very helpful tool to both doctors and patients. So how do we implement this? Compiling the preliminary data, commencing software development, and platform setup, and like previously mentioned, levering, leveraging champions in the environment to get the word out about Inflow. This is our global interdisciplinary team. And in closing to summarize, we are Inflow, a team dedicated to providing the public with accurate information for at home COVID symptom management while providing healthcare professionals with the data they need to improve COVID recovery rates, closing the loop and always keeping the flow of information updated and relevant. Thank you. Wow. Three, three minutes on the dot, two minutes of <laughs> please. And next team, please get ready. Hey, this is Matt Hampson. I'm curious what, the, what specific outcomes you're working to improve. Could you please elaborate? Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's one thing to make people feel like they're reporting their symptoms, but are you trying to keep them from returning to the hospital? Are you trying to get them to return at the right time? Are you trying to help? I'm, I'm just, um, you know, what, what is the, what is going to, what, what behavior would change in a human as a result of this? Um, so it's three part improved access to reliable information. Um, so people being able to use the correct information to treat themselves at home. Um, because we are collecting data and routing it back to the original guidelines, there would be an update for at-home recovery process. So behaviors would change as per optimized protocols from the data that we'd be mining as a result. And to reduce the burden on the healthcare, if you have fewer people burdening the telehealth consult lines or going into hospitals when they don't need to, this is where the app would come in. Okay. Hello? I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you're aware that I mean the CDC has a page dedicated to home treatment. Um, what's different about this? Um, this would be more to optimize the recovery protocols and figure out during the process of at home recovery, especially in vulnerable populations and people with pre existing conditions. Um, what is the information they need? What are they doing? What's working and what's not? And how do we modify at home treatment guidelines, like, for example, the ones the CDC has, as well as worldwide, so that people who are treating themselves in isolation know what to do and how to improve things as more data is collected. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have to move on to the next team for time's sake. Really appreciate uh, the presentation. Um, so next up, we will have team 
Kida Jaga Kida. Um, you guys are up next. So hopefully you can get in here um, and request control of the screen to advance your slides. Sorry, if everyone can just be patient with me real quick. I'm um, promoting and demoting people from presenter. Thanks so much, Tibbs. Okay. All right, awesome. And the next team up is the couple and others. So you guys should be ready. Please raise your hand as soon as the questions and answers for this team begin. And do we have a uh, team Hi. Kita, Kita, Kita in? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Andrew. Excellent. I'm requesting control. Excellent. You're up. You should have control and we'll start awesome. the timer. Cool. I think, how do I, I, oh, whoops. There's two. There's a big lag. Sorry. All right. Cool. Hi, my name is Andrew. Um, I'm a co-founder of Kita Jaga Kita. It, it means we take care of each other in Malay. We're a one-stop user-friendly mutual aid platform. Now, really quickly, the context is there are a lot of mutual aid initiative that sprung up. That's a very good thing. However, the gap, as we've heard, from a lot of initiatives is that there's so many initiatives out there. So the average well-meaning citizen could be confused by the ecosystem. And this might mean that they are their, their intention is not translated to action. So our solution is really simple. How do you compile, you categorize and list initiatives on one central platform and make it easy for users to search based on an objective? So essentially we're a two-sided platform. On one hand, we connect people who need help with NGOs. So if um, on the website you can click I need help and you have you'll get a list of NGOs and initiatives which help you. On the other side, you have a, you connect people who want to help with the NGOs who need your resources. So if you donate, you want to donate money or food, you volunteer, you get that. On the website, we also have functionalities to search based on location <laughs> and beneficiaries. So if you want to help refugees and migrants, other vulnerable communities, um, even donate blood. So we've actually launched this um, and our model has worked. We've launched this two weeks ago and our focus on the user experience and on having a single source of truth has led us to some successes. Um, lots of users, initiatives are coming to us to be listed from the NGOs. We've gained media traction. We are also the default hashtag for social media. Um, so corporates have come to us saying, we wanna do something. Can you connect us to the NGOs which are doing the best work? So now what we have is we, um, this weekend, we are leveraging our success. Um, we think this model can be scaled up um, to other local communities. Um, and in fact, we've inspired some platforms being launched in Germany, which is launching today. And we're in discussions with groups who are planning to launch similar platforms in New York and Miami. The problem here, which is a good problem, is startup friction. So in our ideation this weekend, our solution is very simple. We want to minimize startup costs for a model that has worked and is working. Um, one, we're, um, what we can do is provide a very simple playbook. How do you think of the design um, and, and some of the strategic, strategic details? Um, why did we not choose to have direct aid? Um, why did we choose to rely on NGOs on the ground? The second thing is we rely on plug and play we can offer this as a service, website templates, to um, help teams who want to do similar things um, get off on the ground and running. So in effect, what we're doing is we're helping people with the right intention, providing clarity and structure, translating that to power agency in action. Thank you. Awesome. Great time. And we'll switch it over for two minutes of Q&A. Uh, judges, any questions? I, I, I don't. This was great.
<laughs> Thank you. Yep, same here, no questions. Okay, awesome, great. Um, if we don't have any questions, we will move on to the next team. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Definitely appreciate it. And we'll bring up the, uh, the next team here. So the couple and others, you guys are up. Please, uh, once you're promoted to a panelist, just request control of the screen. And Husky Strong, you guys will be up next. So please get prepared and raise your hand as soon as we begin Q&A. Thank you. Cool. All right, Kathy, you should have control of the screen. Okay, um, thank you. Me? Okay, meet Anna. She's a 27 year old living in New York City. Because of coronavirus, her company has mandated that everyone work from home. So she's spending a lot of her time browsing through Facebook, looking at friends' Instagram stories. In doing this, she encounters, she encounters article after article of horror stories of Asian Americans getting attacked for no reason other than the color of their skin. So even though she was born and raised in Queens, Anna doesn't feel safe going out, even for groceries. But also deep inside, she wishes she spoke out more. It's 2020, there's no excuse for this kind of racism. She wants to know how she can be an advocate and wants to know what to do if she's ever in a racist situation. That's where a voice for us comes in. So back to Anna. She's scrolling through her Facebook newsfeed and she sees that her friend posted a link about a way to track hate crimes in your area. Intrigued, she clicks into it. She lands on an interactive map of what seems to be recently reported hate crimes against Asians. She sees that when you click on a data point on the map, it's linked to the description of the incident. And she sees there's an area to input her address. She immediately wants to check out what's going on in New York City. She also wants to search up the activity in Maryland where her older sister lives. She sees that there's a checkbox for hate crimes and also good deeds. Intrigued, she clicks on the checkbox for good deeds. Up pops a bunch of green dots that seem to represent good deeds done through Asian communities. She clicks on one in New York and reads a story of a young woman who helps a scared Asian grandma walk home. She finds it so heartwarming and immediately feels a sense of community. She also sees a report button on the bottom right, where she finds out that she can report any crimes in her area. Anna feels it's an awesome way to spread awareness of hostile acts and speak out. Let the world know that this, this isn't okay and that Asians will stand up for themselves. Finally, she sees a button for resources. She figures out it's a compiled document of really helpful information from how to determine something is even racist or not to know what to do if she's ever in a racist or hostile situation. With the tracking of hate crimes, the sense of community support, and the availability of educational resources, Anna can speak up with an educated mindset. But most importantly, she feels like she can protect her family in a way. So let's take a step back. We, wanna, we wanted to make sure that someone like Anna really would benefit from this platform. So we did a quick gauge using our best friend, social media. We were met with an overwhelming confirmation that people would use something like this. Although this is by no means an actual usability test, it does provide a good data point in showing that people would truly be, this would be truly beneficial for people like Anna. 30 seconds. Again, we are a voice for us, an online community supporting Asians and allies during COVID and beyond. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Kathy and team. We'll shoot it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. This is, um, it's unfortunate we need things like this. Um, I guess my, my question is, you know, what's the, for the end user here, is there any sort of call of action? I do like the, the concept of registering the good deeds. Is there anything else that you envision, you know, promoting or having people do on the back end of this? So we, we built out a growth kind of strategy, uh, which we can show you in the appendix. Uh, we're ideally going into, sorry, uh, we're, we're trying to build this uh, community. So um, ideally we can support movements. Uh, we can have donation links for people that have kind of suffered these kind of attacks. Um, so it's just very, uh, building a uh, community that's um, very engaged with this whole process, I guess. Do you envision cool. this will be just limited to Asian populations or that other people would use it and would people want to be able to sort by different um, different types of activities, you know, maybe they're disabled or something like that? 
How would you separate those? Um, I, we're not sure with uh, that at the moment. Um, we just thought that this was a great entry point, especially um, I feel like just the idea of building a community and building allies um, is, oh, yes, is a good starting point. We'd like to yeah, um, we think right now the current, um, as it stands, this is really applicable to Asian Americans in a time of COVID. Um, but something that we did definitely consider is scaling out um, and making this available and um, helpful for other communities um, who also may experience hate crimes or racist um, situations. Excellent. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next team. Really appreciate it, though. Um, so up next is Team Husky Strong. And after Husky Strong, we will have COVID Collective. So Team COVID Collective, once the Q&A begins, please be sure to raise your hand just so that we can get you um, promoted to panelists so you can present and, and speak along with your slides. All right, Team Husky Strong, whenever you're ready, I will begin the timer. My check. You guys ready? Tom, Tom, you're muted. All right, I'm not sure what's going on here, but we're going to just hear me. No, we can't. Now we can. What? Oh, yeah, we're good. Okay. We can hear you now. Uh, okay. I'm going to start the timer so you guys are ready to go. Guys, your, your time is running, so I would urge you to, to start. Hello, everyone. We are Husky Strong. Is it working? Oh, yeah, it's working. No, Tom, we can't hear you. Okay, okay. let's just start. Hello, everyone. We are Husky Strong, a group of students from UConn with diverse backgrounds and specialties Hello? coming together to combat food insecurity for the elderly in the time of COVID-19. Older, Older individuals are at a higher risk and have a greater likelihood of dying if contracted with COVID-19. Even before a pandemic, 5.7 million seniors were found food insecure. During a pandemic, the elderly face significant problems in addition to health issues such as social isolation and centers being closed. Our solution minimizes any confusion technology could create and stops the exposure of elderly to the public while also creating a personal interaction with the volunteer. So our approach is to become a liaison between elderly people without access to technology and food pantries and shelters starting in Wyndham County. We identified this specific community using a COVID-19 vulnerability map as shown here as a food desert near Yukon. Because our target population may not have access to technology, we can identify potential users through advertisements or family requests. Then we will, we will send local drivers to drop off a stand with a mounted tablet at the user's home, allowing for virtual interaction between the volunteer and user. The volunteer and user can then communicate using the tablet attached without physically touching the tablet through a video call in order to gather the user's food needs or deliver pertinent COVID information. Next, we'll be collecting necessary food items from a local food bank in Wyndham County. Finally, we'll be able to deliver the items safely to their doorsteps. This approach overall expands access to groceries with a personalized food delivery system designed to minimize exposure. A community model. We will operate as a nonprofit. Having reached out to multiple businesses and department, we know that it is feasible to acquire tablets and vans for transportation through our partnership with the school. For funds to sustain our organization, we will rely on existing public services. Only requiring a simple conversation, our solution is easy to understand for those without access to technology and works to extend the reach of programs already instituted within communities. In doing so, our proposal offers potential solutions for many additional parts of the elderly life that is affected by COVID, such as food insecurity, social isolation, and access to internet or educational resources. 
Our next steps are our next steps are to work with local partners like Covenant Soup Kitchen, Food Share, Wilmette Co-op, and even Big Y that have already shown a willingness to, to collaborate with us. Our services can also expand the reach of similar partners such as TaskRabbit and Instacart into tech-free regions. We are Husky Strong. We are engineers, scientists, and public servants, but most of all, we are a dedicated team invested in the betterment of our community. So thank you for listening. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And we'll throw it over to the judges for uh, two minutes of q and I think one of the issues with access to the community is cell service or Wi-Fi, um, not just the tech for the tablet. I saw your footnote on um, possibly obtaining these from high schools. How do you plan to tackle that, the connectivity? Hi. That's a great question. Yes. Um, we actually are thinking about the van that will deliver the tablets having a mobile hotspot. So the tablet will have access to the Wi-Fi during delivery. Yeah, and then one of the advantages of this project is that there's a lot of scalability. So one, we could start with houses that do have internet access, and then with your help, we can create that mobile hotspot. How do you, um, how do you plan to screen the volunteers or other workers to make sure that they are not carrying COVID and could spread it uh, unintentionally to those that they're going out to meet with. Um, so, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I think the beauty of this is that there's very, very minimal interaction um, between the uh, user and the volunteers. So, when we are presenting the tablets, there should be no need for the senior citizens to actually touch the tablets for them to come in contact, um, to come within even six feet of a volunteer. So there will be minimal exposure. Yeah, as the volunteers are remote and through a voice conversation. Excellent, any last question from the judges? Just a quick one. I assume they could bring their, they could use their own device too, right? The volunteer or the user? Excuse me, the user. So the user actually is tech free on their end of things. They will only have to talk through the volunteer through the tablet put I at see. their doorstep. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're operating under the assumption that uh, the, the, our vulnerable population does not have technology. Yes, okay. that's our target. Thanks. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, guys. And then we will move on to the next team. Um, so COVID Collective, hopefully your hands are already raised um, and we'll get you promoted to presenter and get you control of the screen. Next up will be Team COVID Kits. So Team COVID Kits, once the Q&A begins, please raise your hand. Um, Wait, what the hell, they muted me at the beginning. I'm sorry? Wait, they muted Well, I think what we just heard is that, yes, you will be muted when you enter the room. You do need to unmute yourself so that everybody's aware. We just don't want any background noise entering the presentation. So Team COVID Collective, um, whenever you've joined and are ready to go, uh, we will get you control of the screen. All right, it looks like we have Richard here. Okay, Richard, you should have control of the screen and you are good to go whenever you're ready. And Richard, we cannot hear you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, please begin. Okay. Uh. Okay. So, hi, my name is Richard Ron, and I'm part of a team working to develop our idea, COVID Collective which will be an online donation and resource platform for those most impacted by social distancing policies. Um, my team is based at UC Berkeley and we have extensive experience in public health innovation and product management.
The, so the inspiration for our user persona came from the numerous UC Berkeley students from low-income backgrounds that frequently source groceries from organizations like the Berkeley Student Food Collective. Current shelter-in-place policies have forced organizations like these in the Bay Area to slow or cease operations. We were interested in seeing if similar problems were plaguing other communities, and through research, we found that many families are facing similar major problems across the country. Associated with securing food, health care, utilities, and support, exacerbated by harm to local businesses and current job loss trends. Our target population, which includes low resource populations spread across the U.S., um, um, leads to our problem, which is the lack of solid coordination between people and organizations that would like to contribute services and resources and the communities they're aiming to help. Part of the problem is that the community help documents that do show up are quickly abandoned due to lack of a sizable user base and lack of usage. Our solution is a platform for collective generosity. Uh, we're aiming to provide a centralized location to help impacted individuals and families find what they need. Here are some screenshots from our prototype. Our marketplace will be a centralized location for both offers and requests. Our map will not only compile entries from both the marketplace, but also events hosted by grocery stores and affiliated humanitarian organizations. And our resources section will include carefully verified information pertaining to the COVID-19 and sources of financial support. What we're offering is a centralized, well-publicized one-stop for these vulnerable populations to find what they need in these pressing times, because there's an oversaturation of discommun uh, disconnected community help documents. With our idea being primarily digital, we're aiming to foster relationships with numerous organizations and release our product as soon as possible, which is critical in this situation. Part of the shortcomings of these community help documents is that people only gain access to them through very specific channels. We're aiming to coordinate with media outlets and public health officials and leaders to have our platform as widely known as possible. Within the Berkeley area, we're aiming to collaborate with the Alameda County Public Health Department, which has been known to work well with health innovation efforts. And we currently have relationships with larger efforts like Check Up On Me and Reach For Help with parallel missions and are ready to launch a suite of similar functionalities across multiple countries, as well as contacts at UCSF Startup Incubator and um, Berkeley Skydeck in ensuring the long-term feasibility of the platform. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll give it to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Just a really quick question, just for clarification. This is, these are all, this is to facilitate donations, right? Because you, when you mentioned marketplace, obviously this concern of, of pricing and whatnot. So this is, this is truly all donations. Yeah. So what we're finding is that like numerous, um, um, numerous, organizations are um, actually hosting events for impacted populations to come and get resources at specific times. And sometimes even grocery stores participate in this. Excellent. Any other questions, judges? Okay, it sounds like we can move on to the next team. Thanks so much for your presentation. And we will move on to team COVID kits. So team COVID kits will welcome you and allow you to remote control the screen. Next up is Pony Express. Team Pony Express, please raise your hand once Q&A starts um, so that we can get you control of the screen. Um, and it looks like we are ready to go here. Just make sure you uh, unmute yourself so we can hear you. Uh, can you all hear me now? Yes, that we can. Okay, awesome. Um, sorry, how do I go back? Shoot. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, this is Team COVID Care and we're super excited to present our solution to you all. Meet Jane. Jane is a 32-year-old woman. Whoops, sorry. Uh, okay. Jane is a 32-year-old woman with two little kids in New York City, and she just lost her job due to the economic crisis caused by COVID-19. She lives paycheck to paycheck and has no savings whatsoever. So right now, she doesn't even have the money to provide for her family. She wants to know where she can find cheap or free food in these times. 
there's a million other people like Jane right now who are in the similar situation. So our team really focused on solving the problem of how can we provide access to low cost or free meals and groceries to people like Jane directly from the local neighborhood. Out of the million problems that people like Jane are suffering go, going through right now, our motivation to solve this particular problem really came from the fact that one in three people going to the food shelters right now have never needed help before. So you can only imagine how much stress that has caused on the food shelters and they're running way over capacity. Also the fact that 30 to 40% of the food supply is wasted. Consumers tend to buy and cook food more than they need and then they tend to throw out the extras. What our solution is trying to do is connect the people like James who might have a surplus in their households and they might be cooking extra or have extra groceries and connecting them with people in need right now who just lost their jobs in their local neighborhood. So Jane can go onto the app and request people for prepared meals or groceries and James will see her request and accept it, prepare the food and go drop it off at her place all while practicing social distancing. Our solution really fills in the blanks in our current uh, system there is a surplus of food in households. There are people who want to help and contribute to the society and people are aware of the at the door food delivery situations. So our solution is really the culmination of all these three pillars, which assists in, which primarily assists food shelters to solve for the excessive needs with the local food distribution and get, giving people a sense of belonging and community in these dark times. And most importantly, providing free meals and groceries directly to the people in need right now from their neighborhood. 6.6 .6 million people apply for unemployment in USA since March 26, and out of that, 3.7 million people have no savings and they do have, but they do have a smartphone. So our target user base is really those 3.7 million people who can download our app and reach out to their neighbors for help. 30 seconds. Our business model is based on donations and partnering with nonprofits with a similar mission. And in the future, we'd like to partner with delivery apps who have a sophisticated infrastructure system. This is a team that we all worked on this together with and thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you so much for the opportunity and would love to take any questions you all have. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and we'll throw it to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Have you thought about liability issues of um, home cooked meals that are delivered to others? Um, there's a lot of you know, regulations around food safety, which is different than donating whole foods such as like fresh fruits and vegetables. For sure. Uh, yes, we are. And it is a leap of faith assumption that we have right now that we'd like to test in the market, but it is very similar to uh, Airbnb and Uber uh, hypotheses that someone would want to live in someone else's house and someone would want to drive in someone else's car. So yes, we are aware of that. And something that we would like to include in the app is definitely including dietary restrictions. So you're not, you're being mindful of allergies and stuff, things like that. But um, yes, that is something that we feel like in these dark times, which should be, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get uh, past with and we will have a security agreement highlighting that you're responsible for the food and any harm caused will uh, be there will be legal actions against it and we will have a security ID verification process in the app. So, so social distancing is good it keeps people separate but sharing food is essentially violating that. Um, food sharing is a high risk operation many people with COVID-19 are minimally symptomatic or even asymptomatic so if I've prepared a meal in my house and I have no symptoms it's highly likely that that food will be contaminated, even if I never come within 20 feet of the person I'm giving it to. Um, so I think, I think there's, a, there's an inherent risk here of disease transmission that, that needs to be um, looked at a little more closely. Um, yeah, definitely. And um, thanks for that call out. But I think this is very similar to restaurants right now. Like all the restaurants are also cooking food and delivering it to lots of people. And that is allowed by the CDC. Uh, so. Yeah, but something to be mindful of in the future for sure. Awesome, thank you guys so much. We're gonna go ahead and move on to the next team. Uh, really appreciate your presentation. So next up, we will have Pony Express. Pony Express, hopefully your hands are raised. We're able to get you in here as presenters and get you control of the screen. Um, coming up next, we will have uh, Brigade. Brigade. Um, and please make sure that you are raising your hands when the Q&A begins for Team Pony Express. That way we'll get you up here uh, very, very quickly. Um, so Team Pony Express, um, once you request access to control the screen, uh, we should be good to go. All right, hi everyone. 
Um, we're Pony Express, and we're here today to present a community-driven grocery delivery service. Now, there's great fear among people, particularly the elderly and immunocompromised, about going out shopping for groceries. However, they don't really have much of a choice, as online vendors are dealing with large demand and low stock, and grocery delivery services are facing strikes and backlash due to pressure on workers to continue deliveries through the pandemic. So that is why we are here today to propose Pony Express, a volunteer-based delivery service that seeks to condense trips to the grocery store, thereby promoting social distancing efforts while ensuring access to essential resources like food. Our service allows people to rely on others in their community to deliver groceries, thus reducing risk of infection. All right, so this is a video walking through the prototype that we've made. This is Pony Express, and on the nav bar, if you click on requests, you'll be able to see a page with all the posts that where people can request items that they want to be bought and that other people can see and offer to deliver. Those in yellow are in higher priority, so made by people who are elderly or immunocompromised. Couriers is the same format, but you'll be seeing the other end. So where are people delivering to and where are people making shopping trips to? This is a form for posting a shopping trip. So you just enter in the details of where you're going and when you're going, as well as your contact information. Here, we've also implemented a safety guideline. So if you see the two check boxes at the end, you have to confirm that this will be a contactless delivery and that you are not sick. Now, after posting a delivery, uh, we've implemented this really neat feature where you can see the requests made in a nearby county. Uh, this way, you don't have to filter through individual requests and you can easily help people uh, by offering to deliver within your community. Now, finally, we have uh, My Orders, where you can track the requests that you've made, as well as the shopping trips that you've made, left and right, respectively. And if you click on Track Progress for an individual shopping trip, this is the page that you will see. So what are the advantages of our app? As a delivery service, we innately reduce social interaction and help immunocompromised individuals maintain their access to essentials like groceries. However, importantly, through our safety guidelines and by promoting community action, we decrease the risk of transmission within a neighborhood and community. Specifically, this service helps neighbors work together to consolidate their time outside and decrease their risk. Finally, we plan on contacting small local grocery stores within the SF Bay area so that who may not have access to other delivery services and work with them to make sure that they are able to maintain their small businesses. Currently, we have a working prototype and are ready to implement this within the next few weeks after we have contacted these local grocery stores. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much guys. And we'll throw it over to the judges for a two minute Q and A. So on the, on the back end of this, uh, and sorry if I missed this, th this is a volunteer service, or would you have people who now conceivably work for places like Instacart also kind of going into this space? And, and if it is, that, right, it's an issue because of the, there's just so much demand right now for those people anyways. So uh, primarily we're hoping that uh, this is like a more of a community service so that maybe instead of uh, you, your neighbor and your other neighbor going each going once a week to the, uh, to the grocery store, you would use this app and consolidate your trip so that you would only need to go uh, once every three weeks and pick up, and when you go, you would pick up your neighbor's groceries and they would do likewise. So this is more of a neighborhood, neighborhood community service app to help connect people and organize these trips. Uh, so we wouldn't have uh, external like delivery volunteers per se. How do you truncate the, um, the request sort of geographically? Uh, I think Wenxin can take this question. Yeah, so ideally we would have to uh, track each user's uh, like geolocation, and so we can filter out the requests by their location. So if you log into a page, you'll see the requests and deliveries that are near your current location, and uh, so uh, there will be a filter for that. Excellent. Any other questions from the judges or we will move on to the next team. <clears throat> All right. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So the next Thank team you. is Bridge Aid. Um, team Bridge Aid, if you can just make sure your hands are raised, we'll get you 
uh, set up as a presenter, and then we'll move on to team spreading facts. So team spreading facts, please make sure that your hands are raised when we begin the Q&A for Team Bridge Aid. All right, it looks like we have uh, Yasmina. Uh, yes, we're just waiting for someone else to join. Sure. Okay. Hey, we're Bridge Aid, and we're super excited to present to you today. Next slide. Thank you for bearing with us. <laughs> go back to the first slide, please. We had the trouble with the remote. Yeah, so we can go to the next slide. So, hey everyone. So, like us, you're probably uh, sitting at home right now. Sorry, Paul, uh, can you go back to the first slide, please? Thank you. All right, there we go. Excellent. All right, so, um, yeah, so you're probably, like us, stuck, right? Uh, listening to us, uh, probably very worried about the news and all the crazy uh, figures we're hearing about numbers of cases, massive unemployment, the crisis is hitting us all. Um, and, and so you're probably wondering, right, like how, how can I help? How could I help here just locally? Um, and the reality is that there are people on the ground already um, that are serving our vulnerable populations like food banks. So what we decided to do was to call Paul. He's a director at the local food bank here in Medway, a greater Boston area. And he um, told us that in the last week, the number of families lining up for food has doubled. And his, you know, his volunteers are already overwhelmed and he needs a lot more food. So, so we just asked, like, how, how can we help? And frankly, his answer was just money, right? Like, yes, we need food, we need all these other things, but we don't have time. We need, we need money so we can actually buy what we need right now. Uh, pay some more contract workers and really um, deliver to the public. So you're, you're not alone if you want to help, right? We actually did a survey amongst our networks uh, yesterday and we got answers back from over 30 countries. And the good news is, of course, you know, most everyone wants to help um, and about half are quite comfortable donating money. So our solution is the Bridge Aid platform. We allow you to donate money anywhere, anytime, to people who actually need it, and you will be able to track impact in real time. So basically, to use our platform, you just have to download the app. You will be able to access your profile and choose how you want to help, in this case by donating money. You can then access the map to check for local NGOs around you and get information on what they do where your money goes, contact numbers, and links to websites and social media accounts. Most importantly, you can donate money directly on our app. This platform will allow individuals and businesses to donate money and other resources to NGOs and thus help the vulnerable populations. Our app is now live. You can download it and check out our website. We would like to thank Amazon Web Services for, for providing us with free credits to make this project possible. So how are we making this happen? Our team is super committed to taking this forward. Uh, we already have the live app and we are going to pilot this in Boston um, while thinking about scaling and promoting this beyond Boston. We need to get some funding from government grants. And of course, um, as we uh, ask for money, well, there'll be an option for people to also donate to our platform. As you can see, our team members come from very, very diverse educational and cultural backgrounds, and this is essential as we need a global team to address a global challenge. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And we'll hand it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Uh, this is great. Thank you. This is, this is Mike. Just a, a quick question on the, on the back end. You know, I think we've seen a number of these types of platforms, and, and how do you qualify those at the, on the back end who receive these donations is, is actually needing to receive these um, just to prevent some, you know, whatever type of fraud could be. So basically, hi, I'm Diego. I'm the one to the le bottom left. 
uh, there are two types of screening processes when relating to NGOs. You have the people who ask for help screening and NGO screening. So when it's about people who ask for help, lots of food banks, such as the Greater Food Bank of Boston, have their own screening processes. So we have to balance the trade-off between integrating their own internal processes or implementing an in-house or third-party screening service. And when it comes to NGO screening, we thought that automatic verification by cross-referencing with the officially recognized NGOs by the Massachusetts state can be done, and manual verification for the rest. We have already structured around 549 NGOs through their public API. Um, yeah, I think that's it when it comes to fraud. Oh, and also the payments is going to be done through a strike. Could you hear me? Yes, Okay. thank you. <laughs> And one other thing, uh, sorry, um, that we thought about to actually make the people who donate comfortable with the um, NGOs that they're looking at is we will essentially channel the uh, social media feeds from the different NGOs. So you'll actually be able to see, oh, like there's this organization and look like they're real. This is what they do. Uh, this is what they're going to be doing with your money. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for your presentation and all the hard work this weekend. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next team. Um, so we'll get that queued up now. Okay, I recorded that. Team Spreading Facts. Uh, so Team Spreading Facts will get you all uh, lined up here with control to change your slides. And next up will be Team FMPE. So Team FMPE, please make sure that you raise your hand in uh, the webinar as soon as we move on to Q&A. And Mercy, it looks like we have you here. Um, I'm going to hand over control. And if you could just unmute yourself, we'll get you going. All right. Awesome. Um, do I have uh, control to the keyboard? Yeah. Oh, it's not working for me. It says we're waiting for you to take control. Oh, um, let's see. Come there on. we go. All right. Um, hi, everyone. We are Spread the Fats, and our mission is to empower low-income African Americans in protecting themselves against COVID-19. African Americans face um, a higher, sorry. Oops. Oh, there we go. African Americans face a higher risk of COVID-19 infections and uh, fatalities for three reasons. This population um, experiences higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease compared to their white counterparts, which are conditions that have led to um, high deaths of, uh, from COVID-19 um, in Italy. Second, there's limited access to accurate race-specific information about COVID-19. And lastly, there's an Im implicit bias in our healthcare system on how to treat African American patients, especially during this pandemic. Without targeted, well distributed um, communication on virus severity, risk, and prevention, these communi communities are in danger of not only spreading the disease, but also contracting it in large numbers. So as spread the facts, we're providing mail and phone uh, communication aimed at educating low income African Americans on race specific risks, appropriate measures and local resources. The reason we choose to focus on mail and phone communication is because a significant number of low income Ameri uh, African American people um, have limited or no access to the internet. So our first task is to increase awareness around health misconceptions about uh, COVID-19 through mailers. And the reason why we choose to um, reach our audience through mailers is because 82% of direct mail is actually opened and 47% of direct mail is actually read, which increases, um, uh, improves our outreach to these communities. Secondly, not everybody has internet, but many people have phones. So we've created um, a user-friendly SMS audio bot that provides these uh, populations with information on frequently asked questions around health risks and preventative measures and information on local uh, resources that span hospitals, um, shelters, and hotlines. Our beachhead market is Texas, and we plan on uh, distributing our first set of mailers um, by April 14th and providing access to the SMS and audio bot by April 19th. 30 seconds. 
we have an incredible team that is well positioned to actually solve this problem with experience spanning uh, from software engineering, product, communication, operations, partnerships, and engineering. Our ask is simple. Uh, we're looking for 12,000 in funding to test and distribute one, one, 140,000 mailers and also launch our SMS and audio app. We're also looking to connect with corporate partners and government agencies in Texas willing to fund this initiative. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, guys. And we'll push it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. The, the $12,000 in funding, will that, you know, that, will that get you the, it will give you the ability to, to print the mailers that you need to print for this first wave? And, and did you, do you have any thoughts on, on how much you'd need for kind of a second wave? Yeah, so uh, to elaborate a little bit, so our first um, target market or our first pilot will focus on Dallas County. Um, and uh, we calculated that there's around 120,000 African Americans uh, that live be below the poverty line. So 9,000 of that money will actually go into distributing those mailers. And then um, in terms of like this SMS and audio bot, the main expense is sending and receiving text messages. Um, so the rest of that money will actually be um, geared towards sending those free, uh, free messages to um, African American residents in Dallas. Do you have an expert in health literacy in your team? Um, unfortunately not. Uh, we were looking for one, but we did get a mentor who um, provided us feedback on um, our solution and idea. How do you um, envision creating rapport with the target population or a sense of credibility to where the mailer won't immediately end up in the trash or the, or the, the people will believe um, the information and then follow it? Yeah, so we're, we're looking to build credibility in two ways. So the first way is actually having a, a, a picture of an African American doctor or physician on the mailers um, to make it relatable and trustworthy to uh, the African American individual that receives this. And the second way is actually um, partnering up with hospitals uh, to actually endorse um, and help us brand this pamphlet as something that is uh, accredited by a healthcare institution. Thank you so much. And we're going to have to move on to the next team here. Um, oh, there we go. And the next team, Team FMPE, if you guys have your, your hands raised, that would be great. We'll get you set up as presenters. And after that, we will have Team COVID COP. So Team COVID COP, when we begin um, Q&A, please make sure to raise your hands in the Zoom so that we can get you set up as presenters. Um, okay, how do I request access? So oh, okay. All set. Okay, cool. Um, hi, everyone. <clears throat> We're team FMPE. So how do you practice social distancing when you live on $3 a day, you share a bathroom with hundreds of people and you don't have access to running water? Social distancing is a privilege that many people around the world don't have access to. Now, when you cannot uh, socially distance, having a mask is a way to mitigate the spread of the virus. And a lot of studies have come out uh, recently ex exactly sharing that. The CDC and WHO uh, are now recommending the general population to wear masks and even have come up with these simple instructions uh, to create your mask using textile and readily available um, uh, materials. Uh, this is valuable information that unfortunately is not reaching the communities in need in low-income communities uh, around the world. So our solution is leveraging existing distribution networks to dis disseminate these instructions uh, for DIY masks to under-resourced communities around the world. And we're going to leverage two, um, uh, two specific networks. First, humanitarian organizations and NGOs, which are actually already um, tackling this problem. Uh, they are present in many countries and reaching uh, communities around the world. And second, our main innovation is uh, targeting fast moving consumer goods uh, companies, uh, which have expansive distribution networks around the world. You can find a can of Coke or a bottle of Unilever shampoo anywhere you go uh, in the world. These are brands that people trust and that uh, they're loyal to. And finally, on the company side, there is genuine interest uh, from the FMCGs to tackle the crisis. 
And the solution we're proposing will have low operational change for them, but high impact. So we've designed uh, this flyer um, with some instructions on how to um, make a mask yourself and, and different uh, actions uh, to take that we will um, share with the FMCG uh, companies and have them disseminate that through their supply chains to the end uh, consumers. In the medium term, we also want to work with some companies to actually change their product uh, and potentially print this on uh, either Coke cans like this or on rice bags um, like, uh, like this. Now, once people actually have access uh, to masks, we want to make masks sick and, and really increase the, the, the usage of these masks. In order to do that, we'll do simple and action-oriented uh, communications through text messaging or TV ads. Um, we want to set examples uh, through community leaders, uh, religious figures, and influencers. This is something that is already uh, being done in um, many countries uh, around the world. Um, and finally, we strongly believe in the psychological impact of uh, increasing mask uh, access uh, in, in that it will be a visual cue uh, to fight um, the virus and as well just discouraging uh, face touching. So our team uh, spans across six time zones uh, in four different countries. We've been uh, working around the clock for the past uh, 36, 48 hours. Um, and we've interviewed a bunch of people in other communities that uh, we're targeting. Um, and yeah, super excited to present this to you. Thank you so much. And we'll bring it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. How are you thinking of tackling the needs for different languages? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's obviously something we've thought about. Our template for now is in English, but it's very easy to edit that and disseminate this uh, in local languages, um, uh, as well as asking um, kind of local populations to uh, tailor the message as, as required. How do you envision you'll get access to some of these um, big corporations or start talking to them? Yeah, I mean, I think first through this community, uh, through the MIT community and through anyone uh, participating in this, uh, in this challenge, our mentors and anyone, everyone that we have been um, uh, talking to have been uh, very uh, supportive. And then hopefully if this idea um, kind of gathers uh, interest, then we can gain traction. Uh, I think it's a global problem that is affecting every single person uh, in the world. And so hopefully we can uh, manage to gain access in that way. All right. Thank you guys so much. We'll go ahead and move on to the next team here. Um, so the next team we have is COVID COP. COVID COP. Um, we'll get you set up as presenters in just a moment. Um, team Lighthouse. Team Lighthouse, you'll be up next. So once we begin Q&A, please make sure that your hands are raised. Um, and we will go ahead and get started with COVID COP. Yeah, can you guys hear us? Yes, that we can. Um, and I'm okay. just giving you control of the screen, so you should be good to go. Let's just, I'm just testing whether we can. Okay, um, just give us a second. Hello everyone, my name is Adit Shah and I'm here to present COVID COP, our solution to mitigating the spread of misinformation in today's crisis. And this really stems from the critical role that social media plays in spreading misinformation and information overload. As a disaster and distress hotline and national suicide hotline crisis worker myself, I have witnessed firsthand the tenfold increase in call volume we've noticed as COVID-19 spreads through America these past few weeks. The sheer number of callers I've had to emotionally de-escalate from hysteria induced by misinformation from Facebook posts or WhatsApp posts linked to things as simple as how long you can hold your breath to whether or not you're infected or even the greater number of people that are just overwhelmed from the sheer number of pings they're getting on a second to second, minute to minute basis about the crisis that are only increasing their anxiety and stress. And I think our team has boiled this down to the inextricable link between social media and society. Today, nine out of 10 Americans source their news from social media alone, and 60% of us don't read past the first line. A quarter of us admit to sharing fake news, let alone those who are inadvertently doing so on a daily basis. 
This is all linked to our behavioral inclination to seek information that aligns with our preconceived notions. And so in light of this, we want to present a solution that augments our current information seeking behaviors rather than expecting society to onboard onto a new platform. So our solution is COVID Talk, a browser extension that uses an integrated NLP to parse through social media posts and address two key problems, misinformation and information overload. So how does it work? Imagine that you have a Facebook post by Dave Bird. It first identifies whether the post is COVID related from a bank of key terms. In this case, the word is pandemic. Next, it parses through the post and identifies topics based on the keywords. It categorizes the post based on topics. This one is about vaccines. These categories can be also used to filter out the post. This is then used to directly link pages from credible sources regarding the topic of the post itself, or if we choose to, filter out the post in total. Now there's three key aspects of the solution that make it optimal. It's scalable in the sense that it can be brought up very quickly and can have a high impact. It can also be adapted easily by integrating into existing social media platforms without having to transition to third party platforms. And there's no COVID related NLP that can currently augment social media platforms as we're suggesting. 30 seconds. Our implementation timeline, we wanted to align it well with the time course of the pandemic. And as a passionate team of, team of engineers, we're confident we can get a beta prototype to roll out in the course of days. Working with clinical experts at our home institutions to vet and validate the resources we're gonna link users to, we can have a platform ready to roll out in partnership with social media researchers like Habit Lab at Stanford and national public health organizations to make an impact when it matters the most. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, thanks guys and great timing and we'll pass it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Could, could somebody just say just a little bit more about how you deal with misinformation? I saw how you, how you would potentially link it to sources. Um, but if, you know, we've, we've heard about in, in some presentations about fake news, like how, how do you, how do you deal with that? Right, right, right. So I think the biggest concern is taking sources that are invalidated. So we create the preloaded deck of sources. So we're not allowing this parser to randomly go on the internet and find the most relevant source. We're preloading sources such as CDC, NIH, um, uh, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So we are taking control of which sources are validated. And we also have healthcare, uh, healthcare like professionals, like doctors. And medical professionals. And so in addition, the idea is we're not going to decide whether something is fake news or not. We're just going to parse the post to see what it's about and then provide objective information sources that are related. It, it's, um, I've asked this question, before. What what's kind of the outcome that you would expect? Like if you could measure something what would you measure and what would you expect to see as a, uh, as a, as a benefit to this? Mary, can you explain the question? Yeah. So if, what, what's the outcome that you expect to, to improve with this? I know you may not be able to measure it, but let's say hypothetically you can measure whatever you want. Pie in the sky, you can get any data you want. What, what needle do you want to move with this? I think it's, it's twofold. So one, on the information side, for example, in places like New York where they're having to put people on hold on 911 because of just the number of people in panic, I think if we can go to reduce panic by reducing the spread of information like this, that would be immensely useful to reducing burden in high epidemic areas. And then secondly, I think by having this directly in the social media platform, we can directly change uh, people's behaviors in, you know, when they're going to make a post and, you know, their actions in terms of deciding when and how to evaluate resharing and, and things. Like and that. if I may contribute one last comment. Um, so social media contributes some of the most misinformation um, across all of the sources, right? This is just a way of proje uh, projecting the objective truth of the, f like, say someone posts something that's emotionally charged. We can project the objective truth by extracting the information from that post itself. Thank you. We are going to have to move on um, with that last comment Thank in you. there. Thank you guys so much. All right. So we're going to move on to the next team, which is Team Lighthouse. Team Lighthouse, we're going to get you in as presenters right now. Uh, and then we will proceed to Team Connect Ed. So Team Connect Ed, please be ready. Once the Q&A starts, raise your hands and we'll get you in as presenters. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We just need okay. to get you. Sorry, I don't have the control of the screen. 
Yeah, I'll do it for you. No okay. problem. One second. All right. Okay, guys, I'm calling the screen. We'll go for three minutes. Okay, good afternoon everybody. We are Robert and we are a, a platform that is able to connect uh, people that are vulnerable from uh, uh, rural areas with uh, strong healthy people that are happy to help them. So we got uh, uh, the case study that starts with 20% of the French population that is either over 75 years of age or is affected by a chronic disease. Here we have Martin, Marie and John and Sarah, just examples. And what's the problem? They can't get access to what they really need. Moreover, we know that 30% of the population in France at the moment is unemployed due to COVID-19. Robert is one of them. He lives in the same rural areas of the people listed before. He's strong and healthy, but he can't work during the crisis. He wants to help. How is it possible? He can just, for example, go to the supermarket, buy the goods that they need, and bring these goods to their houses so that they can stay isolated and they don't need to go out of their houses, getting in contact with potential COVID-19 positive cases. And here we get into the game. This is our user's journey map. So we have Maria, that is an elder person in need, that can just fill up account details and a budget on our platform through our website or just calling our customer service. In parallel, we will have uh, Robert that wants to help, that will have to create a, a profile on the platform. Based on their geographical location, we will match them so that we will forward the request from Maria to Robert. At this point, he will receive the request, he will be able to purchase and deliver the goods. She will receive the goods and, if happy with the system, she will be able to iterate the process again, doing another order. So what's our business model? We have a caregiver, Robert, and a care receiver, Maria, and we want to put them in contact through Robert, our platform. So the care receiver will have to upload a request and the caregiver a profile. At this point, the care receiver will have to pay our platform with a credit account and a social indexed fee. And we as a platform will pay the caregiver with the purchase value and a delivery fee. So we will put in contact caregiver and care receiver. He will go purchase and deliver for her. She will get whatever she needs and the caregiver will get the reward, a monetary reward for helping in the system and in the crisis. So what are our steps? We have a pilot phase in April 2020 to develop the platform and to run a pilot in Luberon in France. Then in May 2020, we will prototype um, we will launch a prototype in France, we will scale up uh, via public subsidies in France, and then we will get multiple pilots in Europe. And then we will have a scaling phase in July 2021 for a launch in Europe and to scale up via European public subsidies. So who's Robert? We are uh, Chiara, Alexis, Jada, Liosa, and Abzur, and we are a very international and uh, uh, interdisciplinary team. And we are here, or there for you, always. We are the most vulnerable, we create value for those in need, and we recreate social ties and an economic fabric in rural areas that can be brought on also after the crisis. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and we'll move it over to the judges for a Q&A. Thank yeah, I guess my question would be around the implementation timeline, and it looks like it, sometime in July when this would be rolled out. Is there a way to accelerate that given that we know that the need is going to be pretty immediate and, and you know, could certainly be ongoing into the fall for certain services like this, but um, is there a way to fast track this more? Alexis? Yeah, okay, uh, sorry. We can, uh, actually, we've been thinking about uh, launching the prototype uh, all together in uh, different areas. So uh, we can also start the pilots in uh, various locations in Europe in which we have a uh, better knowledge of the, of the local area. And so that we can make the pilot start at the same time, uh, also potentially including the US where we have some connections. So it's, uh, yeah, we, we can fasten the, pro the, uh, the launch in this way. So just to add on to what Kiara said, I think one of the main ways that uh, we could really fasten the process is to get a couple of people with uh, computer science backgrounds in, and then uh, with that with that expertise, we could really uh, help in the in the development process, which is one of the fundamental aspects of developing developing the platform. So I hope I answered the question. Excellent. Thanks guys, and we will move on to the next presentation. Really appreciate it. 
Um, so next up, we have Team Connect Ed. Team Connect Ed, um, we'll get you set up as presenters. Team Viral Science, please be ready um, as you will be coming up next. Once Q&A begins, please raise your hand and we will get the controls over to you. Thank you. All right, Team Connect Ed, if one of you can please take control um, and unmute yourself to begin the presentation. Hello, can you hear us? That we can. Um, could we check really quickly all our other teammates can be heard? Um, everybody should be able to be heard. They need to unmute themselves, but we do need to get started. Cool, sounds good. Um, how do I? Okay, cool. Hello, we are a team of MIT undergrads as well as scientists and engineers trying to combat the infodemic that we are currently experiencing during this pandemic by connecting us with the resources that we need. We were inspired to pursue uh, this topic after participating in a study abroad on epidemics in South Africa and have countless hours of experience working with K through 12 students in curating content. Now, moving on to the problem. Let's see what happens when we try to do a quick, simple Google search for coronavirus resources. Link after link, web page after web page, were flooded with a stream of text, information, and statistics, little of which actually tells us how we can find tailored help for us and how we can best help others. That's where Connected comes in. Our main population of interest uh, were K through 12 young adults who have several uh, user interests, particularly the fact that they want to help grandparents or elderly, but can't find communities who can, uh, but also want to find communities to connect over these resources for. One of the biggest solutions, uh, the solution that we came up with from this was a web platform to connect people, specifically that was clear, friendly, and individualized. So how are we going to accomplish this? To make our website clear, we decided to stratify information into three distinct zones. This is the important part of our pitch. By stratifying into zones, the information is made significantly more clear and digestible. We identified three particular zones as a result. First one is fight it. Fight it answers any of the questions of what we want to do and connects users with trusted resources and methods to take action now. From there, after you know these prevention measures, often the most common question that comes up is what exactly and how exactly does it work? Why do these methods protect us? And learn about it is the zone, next zone that really addresses this question. The final zone is together through it. Sorry. Together through it works to try and connect uh, students and young adults with the resources that they need, uh, resources that they need either to find jobs or to get internet or to help out with initiatives already currently out there doing great work. So everything from tutoring to groceries to research. In addition to our own expertise as students and educators and researchers, in the future we will think to employ a team consisting of an even more diverse skill set. So we have also ensured that our website has a pleasant user interface, easy to understand language and an impactful user experience. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. And we'll turn it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Thank you. As you mentioned, there's already a number of different websites. How will this website be different or how will you be able to advertise this um, to ensure that it gets effectively used? Yeah. 
So I think one of our biggest concerns is exactly that. And one of the biggest things that we con were confronted with with a lot of the organizations that we joined, whether it be everything from like COVID to, uh, which tries to tutor K through 12 students to uh, Joggle, which looks to do research, is the aspect of publicity and trying to connect with people that we already know. Um, a lot of these people are usually young adults who use social media. So finding a way to connect them to this one centralized resource where they can be redirected to all of these uh, resources will be really essential. And we hope to utilize the network that we currently have as young adults to do that. All right, if there's no more questions from the judges, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next team. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have Team Viral Science up. Uh, and next up, we will have Team Mobile Telehealth. So Team Mobile Telehealth, once we begin Q&A, please make sure as a reminder that you have your hand raised in the webinar so we can get you set up to present. So I don't see anybody's hand raised for viral science. Are any of you guys online? All right, I'm not seeing any hands either. So we are going to move on to Team Mobile Telehealth. Um, team Mobile Telehealth, you guys are up. So we're gonna get you all set up to present. Okay, Team Mobile Telehealth, um, we are all set for you. Team Community Act, um, communityact.ai, please be ready and raise your hand when the Q&A begins. Um, Hi, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, could you advance the slides for me? Sure. Just to say next slide and I'll move on. Great. Fantastic. Um, are we ready? We're ready. Okay. Um, hello. My name is Emily Fisher and our team is Mobile Telehealth. Next slide. Vulnerable, underserved, rural, and homeless populations do not always have access to health care. In areas where there is limited internet services, this creates an additional barrier for patients to interact with providers via telehealth technologies, which help in screening for and limit exposure to COVID-19. Next slide. In a time when the number of confirmed cases of the novel coronavirus continues to increase daily, it is astounding that at least 15% of the total U.S. population could substantially benefit from mobile telehealth services. Next slide. It is critical to provide on-site screening and educational tools in areas readily accessible to patients. This allows healthcare systems to provide accurate information about and educate on the prevention, symptoms, and treatment of COVID-19. Our solution is to propose an integrated framework to effectively deploy mobile telehealth. The framework incorporates existing technologies with an intelligent allocation model. Many healthcare systems have telehealth capabilities but they are not used efficiently in mobile settings. Our framework could easily be integrated into these existing telehealth infrastructures and enable other healthcare systems to implement their own telehealth mechanisms. Through the identification and development of relationships with providers and community partners which serve vulnerable populations, our mobile telehealth platform can be developed for use in either a kiosk or vehicle that can be dispatched to different locations as needed. Next slide. The locations of the kiosks are set using a predictive allocation model trained on up-to-date county-level public health, socioeconomic, and COVID-19 data. An example of a training variable, households with home internet access, is shown here. The routing algorithm is continuously updated with current COVID-19 statistics and biometric data collected in the field, leading to a scalable, effective intervention that allows healthcare systems to best use their resources to serve vulnerable populations. Next slide. Over the next few weeks, we plan to use our algorithm to identify an initial location to deploy the mobile telehealth program. This will also assist health systems in allocating an appropriate amount of resources based on data trends for the current symptoms, enabling screening and tracking disease progression. We will identify community partners in these areas and develop and deliver turnkey educational and implementation toolkits. 
Finally, we will collect demographic, biometric, screening, and testing data to update the predictive model to identify additional sites for scalability. Next slide. Our team background includes healthcare administration, health information technology, artificial intelligence, and disability advocacy. Thank you. Awesome and perfect timing. And we will now move on to two minutes of q and I imagine this framework, this platform is going to going to collect a lot of data. Uh, what is what's your data play here? So where are you going to collect it? And you know, at some point, do you envision integrating you know to uh, various health systems EMRs? So um, there should be several of my. Um, I think Savannah or Annie. Um, that question is probably going to you guys. Sure. Hi, this is Annie. Um, for a couple of the pilots that the team is discussing here, um, if we were to go with the health system for piloting, uh, our initial thinking is that we can utilize their uh, existing uh, data warehouse uh, or uh, data lake infrastructure. Um, the data collected uh, would be go back directly into their uh, system. So that, uh, that would be compliance with their current uh, HIPAA compliance uh, policies. Right, and then um, the other way that the data would be used is to update the routing algorithm. Um, so we haven't decided exactly what like biometric bio data we would wanna use for that. Uh, I think we would wanna consult with like a data privacy expert to see what is like reasonably anon uh, anonymous Realizable um, and reasonable to be used um, for that. So we, we haven't set exactly what we would like store for the algorithm yet. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Um, we'll move on to the next team. Really appreciate your presentation. So next up, we have communityact.ai. So we'll get you set up as presenters in just a moment. And after, after that team, we will have uh, Team Educosa. Ed, team Educosa, please be prepared um, and raise your hands as soon as we begin the Q&A here. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, that we can. Fantastic. All right, you should have control of the screen and you're up. All right, we're Community Act AI and we power localized interventions. We have a multidisciplinary team and between us, we've actually launched over 50 ventures. And not only we're multiple, multiple disciplinary, we are also global. So we know that there's no one size fits all um, answer for COVID. We also know that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting some communities much more than others. Currently, everyone's working hard to serve our communities, often through state level risk assessment models, followed by general calls to action. But now we have an opportunity because new data, new granular data is coming out that will allow us to close this feedback loop. We can now create community level risk forecasting models for vulnerable populations, create, warn those community leaders in these populations and give them an intervention playbook for what they can do uh, based on what other communities have done successfully. And then we can mo uh, measure how successful interventions have been through KPIs like hospitalization rates and death rates from COVID. So say I'm a councilwoman from Mobile, Alabama, I can actually come to the community now website and actually see which communities are going to be at most risk in the coming weeks. And just to make this tangible, over the last 36 hours, we've built an API that you can actually see running here on the right that takes into account different socioeconomic parameters and uh, health factors to predict future hotspots for vulnerable areas on a county level. The data for this prototype includes American Community Survey data for economic um, income per capita and uh, population density, as well as uh, Kaiser Foundation ICU bed data. So as the councilwoman for Mobile, I'm obviously like most concerned with what are the risk factors for Mobile, Alabama. So some of my risk factors might be high population density, the high percentage of uh, essential workers who can't stay home even if they want to, or a lack of ICU beds. 
but we also can see based on community act the different interventions that have worked in communities like mine for instance because I have so many essential workers, it's recommending a safety at work program that's worked well in other communities similar to mine. And when Great. I make these changes, um, I can see the effect that it has on my score. So the difference that we bring is we use data to identify hotspots and get ahead of the problem instead of putting out fires. We leverage and focus on local community efforts because tech is only part of the answer. And we create a feedback loop between action and outcome. And this will help us weather the peaks of COVID and maintain stability throughout the pandemic. Our plan for April is to identify top at-risk communities like Mobile, engage community leaders, which we've already been doing. I have a call after this and identify effective interventions. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much. And we'll move it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Thank you. So it occurs to me that I mean, it, it seems sort of every community is at risk mm -hmm. um, and the, the disease spreads, the disease does not spread more in certain individuals, but the outcome is more dire in certain individuals. Yeah. So what is the advantage of this as opposed to something that could be applied more broadly? Because we already know the individuals that are most at risk for poor outcomes. So have you ever heard the quote every family is unhappy differently from that uh, russian novel that's the way we kind of think about it is everyone will have a different need set of needs and a different way that they need to be reached out to in these different communities for instance mobile alabama might be more similar to flint michigan and what interventions will even work and who those interventions can be enacted by like perhaps church leaders or youth group leaders as opposed to los angeles where i'm based so that's really part of it. And the other part of the question is, we're going through this at different times, right? Like some people are already past the peak, some people are coming up to it, and we should be able to take advantage of that asynchronicity to actually learn from what other communities have done well. Excellent. I think that should wrap it up then. Um, thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next team here. All right, Team Educosa, um, you are up next. All right, do we have you there? Are you ready to go? Adi? I am not with this team. I was with COVID Cop, so I'm, you might have promoted the wrong person. COVID Cop. Okay, all right. Well, give us one second. Who from Educosa is ready to present? Uh, please raise your hand in the Zoom. Team Educosa, who do we have from Team Educosa? Please raise your hand in the chat. All right, do we have anybody from, who do we have from, from which um, teams still need to go? If we have any teams that were not present earlier and would still like to go, please throw your uh, name in the track. We have um, Team uh, Track Trace Action, if we have team track trace action, please raise your hand now. Team track trace action. Anybody here from track trace action? Hi there. Oh, we do? Track trace action, that's us, yep. Okay, awesome, let me pull you up really quickly. All right, thank you. And would you mind um, clicking it for me, is that okay? Absolutely. All right, perfect. You are up. All right, great. Okay, thank you for allowing us to present Track Trace Action, a mobile solution that is ready to serve the underprivileged and vulnerable communities across the nation. 
This app was made by underrepresented community members for the underrepresented communities. Next. Given the recent unfoldings of events globally, it's no surprise that this pandemic has caused unease and stress on the world like never before. Our most vulnerable communities, which include the underprivileged, monolingual, and as well as elderly populations are in dire need of solutions to help them navigate their new normal. Our goal is to provide a one-stop shop for them and these communities. Next. We put the individual right at the center of all the resources available to them in their own backyards. No one knows what a community needs more than the community itself. All you have to do is provide your zip code and preferred language, then we give you the opportunity to track your symptoms daily and even self-screen to ensure you're healthy and strong. If the self-screening tool finds that you are in need of a COVID test, we will provide you with useful resources such as links to your nearest drive-through testing facilities or local hospitals with wait times so you know what to expect. Thanks. If Elena Rodriguez, age 30, a flower shop owner from Oakland, California, feels a slight fever coming on, she can log into the TTA app and start tracking her symptoms daily to see if she gets better or progressively worse. Elena can also share the app with her monolingual Spanish-speaking mother, Lisa, age 64, who lives in Texas. TTA allows Lisa to break the language barrier by allowing her to take the self-screening assessment in Spanish and ensure that the questions are being properly understood and tracked. TTA is currently available in 10 languages. Next. There's no question that prevention is key. Moreover, prevention needs to go beyond the scope of clinical settings into communities. Elena in Oakland and her mother, Lisa in Austin, can spread the good word in their own communities by sharing prevention checklists translated in their respective languages. They can even be emailed and printed for healthier reminders to have around the house. Each dynamic checklist will be specific to your region with your local advisories in mind. And the advisories will be updated regularly and alerts will be sent out to your phone. Next. Since Elena herself passed the screening, next after this, sorry. Since Elena herself passed the screening assessment, Elena's individualized dashboards will provide her with tips, access to culturally and linguistically appropriate help and resources near her to drop off donations. Elena can even find community forums to connect for, with others in her neighborhood for mental health and wellness support. Next. 30 seconds. Okay. TTA wants community members to connect and interact with one another. This will allow marginalized communities to find their strengths. Now, will you join us in connecting the dots to keep the vulnerable communities safe? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And we will have, just so everybody knows, we'll have team Disjoin next, then team Covalid, and then team Twin Enduring Wisdom. Um, before the judges deliberate. Um, so now we'll open it up for two minutes of Q&A. How do you plan to source information such as wait times for COVID testing? Uh, we're hoping we could leverage uh, just APIs through public websites and hospitals um, in their local communities and bring that data onto our platform. Our back end is going to be Salesforce Health Cloud. And and how do you manage the the information, the dashboard on the on the back end? So if, if a patient or, or if a user does get into trouble and some of their symptoms escalate, um, who on your side or who some you know who somewhere in the ecosystem is going to flag that patient and, and you know intercede? So we were thinking for um, the next phase, we would potentially let them anonymously um, submit that information either to their local government or their, you know, hospitals, but we haven't gotten there yet. At this point, once they go through the assessment and it looks like they potentially could, um, you know, uh, leverage or, or benefit from taking a test, we'll provide the locations for them specifically. That's it. So many people with disease, in fact, maybe most, most people, especially children, have minimal to no symptoms. How do you account for that in your um, framework? That's an excellent question. So um, thus far, we've just um, thought about creating that comprehensive um, list of symptoms that you may or may not have, in, but the, hopefully the prevention checklist will guide. And, and our differentiator is that we have that translated in about 10 languages right now and more to come. So hopefully with prevention, you know, we wouldn't even have to go through the assessments um, exams. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. We are now going to move on to team disjoin.
And just as a reminder, we will have Team Covalid up next. Team Covalid, you will go next. Dibs, do we have uh, Team Disjoin ready to go? Uh, yeah, they're raising their hands. Oh, perfect. Um. Hi, actually, Bhanu was going to present and he's been removed twice. Like, I don't know why is he getting out of this. I promoted him and now he's gone. Yeah. Priyanka, Priyanka, can we get started with you? Yeah, I can, I can start it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Can you, like, can you give me? Oh, yeah, I have to. I can't get the slides. Yeah. All right. So we are team this join here. We are here to like shop the e shop with ease. This is a website that we are planning to develop. And the problem that we had, like the teammates that were there for in with me, they were from India. And even like my mom, when she went to a grocery store in India, she was given a physical token and asked her to come back after like five to six hours. And that that is when we realized like there is they are already getting in contact with other infected people that they are there on the way reaching to the store. And even here in United States at Walmart, we can see there are long queues and overcrowded stores that are there right now. And we are afraid of visiting the stores of, because of all the crowd that we have or the wait time. So the solution that we are proposing is the having a real time food traffic counters that will get us the data and estimating the traffic of the upcoming slots that we can make them available through this website. So basically you can search, the, you can put in your location and you can get the counts of the number of people that are present in the store right now. And then when you, if you are like see like, oh yeah, all my, there are just 10 people, then this will help you. Like the app will help you to book the, book your app, I mean book the slot for your visit. And you can also help other people uh, in the neighborhood who can like pick for them you can have subscriptions where you can get alerts and even the curbside pickups. This will be the page where you can have booking your slots. You can subscribe for alerts and you can like hero mode is like where you can help people or like pick up. This is the estimation of what will be the next expected for traffic. Uh, the current, when we saw the market current comparisons, there were like, we have pickup, we have delivery available. Some of the sites like Google, they're already having real time data and they can predict the number of people that are there, like, but they're tracking it through Google location. They don't have real time data. Some of them don't use Google location. But with this our website, we can have pickup. We are not looking for deliveries, but we can, you can book the visit. Like when do you want to visit the store? You can have that ticket on your mobile phone and you can just go and visit it. It will be most cost saving. You can receive alerts. You can have community volunteering. You can reduce wait times. This is the plan that we are building where we'll collect the data from different third party vendors or supermarkets and also with the real time customers that they are there who are using our application. Uh, with the application, you can book everything. That, I mean, all the slots, traffic predictions and pick a point service and community volunteer. This is my team. Uh, we were a diverse team. But yeah, this is my proposal. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for bearing with us uh, with any technical difficulties on Zoom. And we'll move it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. Yeah, thank you. So what will you need from the, especially from the supermarkets? Will they have, will they interact with you as far as the data around the, you know, the utilization in their, in their shops and their wait times? We'll need the customers, like the footprint of the customers, like how many do they have right now with the use of the cameras that they have. We can get the count of the data or we can like integrate with Instacart or Amazon or Walmart. In that case, Walmart already has pickup and delivery. So if they can give us the data, like how many people are present in the store, we can get information through this. Like we can get the information to the people who are at home. They can book the slots if there is less crowd in the store. Excellent. If we don't have any other questions, we will move on to the next team. Thank you very much, Priyanka. 
um, we will go to team Covalid. Um, and then after Covalid, we will have the last team, which is team Twin Enduring Wisdom. Um, so team Twin Enduring Wisdom, if you could please raise your hand once we enter Q&A for team Covalid. All right, Team Kovalid, um, if one of you can unmute your microphone and we will um, pass you control. Hi, um, yeah, I can do that. All right, Alicia, you should have control now um, and then we can start whenever you're ready. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. Um, here we go, okay, we're ready. So, um, so we're Covalid and or Covalid, uh, and our uh, goal is to fight against misinformation about COVID in social media and news reports. So the uh, impact of misinformation is really large. It can lead to violence, hoarding, stress, and physical harm. So here's an example: um, 44 people died in Iran from alcohol poisoning because they believed that coronavirus could be cured by alcohol. Um, so this is a really big problem. So our motivation is for social media and internet users with little scientific background, but vast access to information to have a method to assess the validity of COVID information they receive. Um, so our solution is an AI application through which a user can select a message, social media post or URL and test the validity of its content. So we have two users. We have a common user who's vulnerable to misinformation and a verified infomediary, which is a professor or a professional providing informational that's authentic. And um, so our model, uh, we have a common user would select a message to be redirected to Covalid. Co and then we'd have our first aspect of source verification in which is in-app assessment of content uh, to see where it was initially published. Our next aspect is content verification, which is in-app assessment of plagiarism similar to current plagiarism software and machine algorithms to identify keywords and mark content as spam. Our third aspect is where the infomediary would come in and they would be able to assign a digital signature to content that they post so users can search their content. So these are things that can be implemented right away. In the future, we'd also move towards evidence assessment. So the ability for infomediaries to annotate and screen articles and provide more in-depth feedback about their validity, as well as a feature that allows passive users to get a notification when they enter a site that is considered misinformation if they're not actively questioning their content. Um, so here's kind of like an example of our user interface design so far, um, how the common, what the common user would see and what an infomediary would see. So about our business implementation plan. So our solution will work because unlike competitors who are creating websites of common misinformation, we're creating a way to interact with the content a user is already constantly consuming. So we're really fitting into their workflow already. And for professionals, we have a way for them to verify the information that they are already um, you know, researching. And um, so our implementation plan includes a pilot study and app validation with a basic mock-up of our um, of what we're doing, and then marketing through um, key opinion leaders, social media outreach, et cetera. And um, in the future, we could collaborate potentially with social media companies, academic research partnerships, experts, and collaboration with authoritative institutions. And this is our team. Um, we all have a lot of different backgrounds, um, and that really gives us a, a competent and diverse group that brings unique perspectives that can work towards tackling this problem. Thank you. Awesome. Great job. And we'll move it over to the uh, judges for two minutes of Q&A. Team Twin, please uh, raise your hands at this point. Thank you. So where do you envision getting your, your content experts from and ensuring that they are, the, in fact, the right content experts? So our, our mentor, um, is actually a person who's already kind of doing this on his end. He's an epidemiologist and um, Dr. Artiman, and he also um, is able to be like one of those people that can do this and access other people who potentially are interested in this. So we'd really look to like validate and make sure that our infomediaries are people who are the correct people and also trained by other people who are doing the same thing.
All right, if there's no more questions, we will move on to the next team. Thank you guys so much. Um, and at this point, we'll go on to team uh, twin, Enduring Wisdom. Um, and I do not have a presentation for you guys. We'll give this just a moment. Yes, hi. Hello. Hi, um, I don't have your slides anywhere. Uh, I can give you a link if you'd like. Um, yep, you can do that. Or if you're able to, if you can just share right now um, so we can get the judges on to oh, the yeah, sure. questions. Okay, um, great. So thanks for joining. Let's see, share screen. Share screen, I'm gonna toggle through while Heidi handles the first bit. Um, great. Can you see my screen? That we can, and we will get going on your three minutes. Great. All right, excellent. So Enduring Wisdom, Bridging the Gap Between Digital Solutions and Generations. Okay. So low-income elderly individuals face, face heightened diversity during the pandemic, with many unable to meet basic needs such as food and healthcare. Because the population's access to technology is limited, simple analog solutions are key to providing information and resource inroads while reducing isolation. The Bronx is a very high need community in New York City, and the pandemic has exacerbated that need. Due to high rates of poverty, older adults who live alone are particularly vulnerable during this crisis. Close to half the population doesn't have connection to the internet, which limits access to existing interventions. All right, so this will be the site of our intervention. Thanks, Heidi. So um, that said, here's the idea. Uh, elderly people use ubiquitous yet underutilized receipts day to day. It's associated with food, medical goods, and services that we can repurpose to share information, shop for someone else, and create social connection. The receipt is a familiar invitation to get information for yourself, connect an elder with two volunteers, and create a vetted three-way buddy system. A volunteer receives a receipt upon entering the grocery store that, that shares an information about an elder, gets to know them, their grocery needs, and how to help. After leaving, they will deliver food items to the elder and continue to grow their relationship. An elder in the same light, feels alone and afraid to leave and get connected. We can get connected with this service by providing a profile to the grocery store. Two volunteers will contact them and ensure their basic resource, informational, social needs are met. Some amazing features, up-to-date crisis information regularly. Think of like this as like a, a mini newspaper in every grocery store. Inroads to technology, it's, it's intentionally a hybrid of analog. Uh, donate or deliver basic needs. Phone calls generate cross-generational story and social support, and it's an easy way to volunteer. Here's our team, and we're uh, looking forward to uh, finding some supporters. We're looking for a volunteer of AARP or VA for our community, local government rep to go through regulations, grocery stores and cellular, cellular companies to help us integrate and to be pilot sites and data, uh, data integration. Uh, this is an idea that is both simple, long-lasting, it's honest, it's uh, thorough and it, and, it, and it honestly leverages pre-existing infrastructure. More importantly, it brings people together that are typically not connected. Um, thank you for your time. Looking forward to any questions. Excellent job on time, right at three minutes. Thank you very much. And we will move it over to the judges for two minutes of Q&A. You have a protocol in place to uh, ensure that the volunteers that are delivering the groceries will do so and you know without risking um infecting uh the elderly folks well i i think that um to answer that point we they are vetted uh up front uh, and uh, as far as traveling groceries let's say or any other household good um that that uh can be sealed in, in some format uh at the grocery store or um we haven't thought about it in complete detail but that was something that was like a secondary concern um uh, beneath the primary idea 
Maybe I, I can add on to that as well. I know that um, you know many uh, senior centers and Meals on Wheels have you know instead of giving the the food directly to the um, to the elder, they're now you know leaving it outside, making sure the elder is there and that they they know that the food is is there for them. Maybe talking through them to them through the door or the window, um, but there will actually not be that. Um, face-to-face -face connection, so trying to, to keep the social isolation. So we, we don't want to right, leave the food out um, for people to steal or maybe you know, worried about food contamination. So we want to make sure that, that someone is home to be able to bring the food in, but uh, it just won't be the delivery person. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Yes, thank you. We've, we've enjoyed this. Good, 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 good. Um, so at this point in time, I just want to first start off by saying thank you to all the participants who worked through the presentations with us. I know there were some technical difficulties along the way, uh, but I'm really glad that everybody could share what they've been working on and all of their hard work that's come out of this weekend. Um, at this point, we will have the judges delivery. Um, yeah, so please um, make yourselves comfortable until the uh, final uh, prize distributions, which will happen. It's scheduled for four o'clock, I suspect, since some other tracks I see are still wrapping up. Will happen a little bit later, but stay tuned. The link will be shared in the general channel if it hasn't already. Um, yeah, and thanks again. Uh, judges, I will reconvene with you uh, right after this. Thank you so much.